Welcome to God of Run. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. My special guest today is Amy Freeze. You can catch Amy on TV most mornings on Survive Witness News. She is New York City's favorite TV personality that covers the weather. I'm honored to have Amy as my guest. Thank you so much. Good to be here. Thanks, Will. My pleasure. Amy, my number one question people ask me is, how did you meet so-and-so? <laughs> In your case, years ago, four or five years ago, I saw this photograph of you with back of my feet mm -hmm. at a charitable event with Terrence Gertzberg. Yes. And I said, well, wait a minute. It looks like Amy's a runner because you were wearing running outfit. Mm -hmm. And part of the mission of this show is to highlight athletes that use running to better the lives of others. So I knew I had to have you one perfect day. Perfect fit, perfect fit. So tell us about how did you find out about Back on My Feet back in four or five years ago. Yeah, you know what? Back on My Feet here in New York was just getting started when I moved to the city. But I'd known about the organization since it started way back in Philadelphia. I want to run a marathon. I want to run a marathon. And I'm going to keep running from dusk to dawn. When we're running, you can't tell. When people look at us, they don't point and go, oh, yeah. He's homeless, she's not, he's educated. You look and say, oh, look at the runners. It was such a great find to be able to find an organization that uses the ethics of running, which is discipline, showing up, doing your best, um, sticking with it, all of those things, using the ethics of running to really get yourself back in the swing of things. So usually it is homeless shelters or people who are looking um, to find jobs or somehow get their housing back. Mm -hmm. And they are invited to be a part of this club Club where they can earn points and not only become runners, but also learn how to do interviews, help get affordable housing, all kinds of things that literally get them back on their feet. That's right. That's right. right. I think you were telling me earlier that you once lived in Philadelphia mm -hmm. and you were actually one of the, if not the first reporter yes. to actually to see the birth of this movement. Absolutely. Um, you know, you know, Anne as well. Um, she started this organization basically out on her own run. She ran past a shelter and there were some guys there and she said, this looks like an opportunity for them to join me. And uh, she got them some shoes and just under the concept of, hey, let's meet at 530 in the morning. And uh, just showing up is sometimes the start of great things. And for runners, we might be just showing up and it's our first 5K, our first 10K. But for most people, just showing up is the start of magical things in their life. And when they begin commitments, even through exercise, it, of course, transcends just the run itself. That's right. Most people don't think of the homeless people. Well, actually, she phrased it very specifically, those people experiencing homelessness and running together. Right. So she started this movement. And I think currently, not only in New York, which started five or six years ago, I think it's now more than a dozen cities across the United States. So it started in Philadelphia and has grown. And here in New York City, it is just such a successful program, expanding in all different directions. And Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 5.30 a.m., um, the residents get together and they run with their different um, communities. And you can also volunteer, so you can show up to run with the residents as well. Many wonderful um, conversations are had, friendships are born, and also you train together for local races, which is great. That's right, they, they train for either local 5Ks, half marathons, even the marathon. So Absolutely. it's a full-fledged program. And what's interesting, what I found interesting about it when I, you know, met with them years ago, that most of the volunteers are runners. Yes, It's absolutely. the running community that makes it happen. Sorry. And the beautiful thing about Ann Malum, she created the movement, and then she decided to do something else. So she built up such a strong foundation, even though she's been gone three or four years, it's stronger and better than ever. Yes, absolutely. And she continues with her love of fitness and in so many other ways. So that's yeah. right. That's wonderful right. legacy. She's, You're very well connected, Will. <laughs> I'm looking to know Many you. wonderful runners. So I finally got you here because, <laughs> because when I saw you five years ago, I actually emailed you one of your Facebook pages. And I think it died a lonely death. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I have to give That's a shout out to Timothy Clark of Personal Record because he reconnected us. Yes. So that's why you're here today. Yeah, Thanks Timothy, to him. Timothy Clark, I recently went up and did a, um, I was there as a spectator for him and to help him with some of his equipment during a, a triathlete race called the SOS Triathlon, which he ended up winning, which was a real thrill. So he's a great running friend. Excellent. And in fact, in looking through the photos, I saw one where you were dressed up, looked like in full fireman gear. <laughs> is there a story behind that? Well, don't worry. I'm not quitting my day job, but there is a good story behind that. Um, around New York City, a lot of the buildings have charity stair climbs. Of course, we're all familiar with the Empire State run up which I've done half a dozen times or so. But this particular um, stair climb is called the NYC Memorial Stair Climb. And it's done in memory, of course, 9-11 and the first responders who sacrificed so much. And so what happens is current first responders get into their gear and they climb the 80 some odd flights of World Trade Center 3 and they do it as part of a run raiser, fundraiser and a memorial. And so um, usually it's just the firefighters doing this, but my local firehouse knew I was coming to do the story. And so they thought it would be kind of fun to put me in the fire gear. And at the same time, someone was making a very generous donation of $1,000. So it kind of worked out, got them over their, um, their hump for uh -huh. their fundraising goals. And I think it took me about 19, 20 minutes to get the top of 86 floors. And I will tell you, it's as hard as a marathon going up all those floors with the you know 20 plus pounds of gear on you. It's very difficult. And I didn't even have on the pants because they were too long. So <laughs> they let me wear my own athletic gear on the bottom. But well, you don't want difficult. you to trip up those stairs. Right. My God. Yeah. Well, that speaks well of you that you were surprised at the last second. You weren't expecting this. <laughs> they just threw it at you and you went with the flow. Yeah, sometimes that's the best way to, to make a challenge is just to go for it, you know, and I had a really good time doing it. Um, but uh, I just so admire our first responders and the things that they, they do for us on a daily basis. We all know about the big sacrifice, but to never forget that is just to remember to appreciate them every day. And they're in our neighborhoods and, and uh, you know, working hard. Well, Amy, let's go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm. Tell us where you were born and something about your growing up years. Yeah, I was actually born as a uh, college baby. My mom and dad met in Utah, Provo, Utah, and they went to Brigham Young University. My dad went there to play football. My mom was from that area. And uh, I was a baby born to them while they were married in college. And so um, just as they graduated, we went back to my dad's hometown, which was in southern Indiana, a little tiny town called Jeffersonville, Indiana. It's right across from Louisville, Kentucky. So since then, I've lived in eight states and major cities. And I always like to say, you know, New York's so big time, but small towns are a different kind of tough. And that's where I was raised. Uh, think of like uh, Friday Night Lights, kind ah. of that, that vibe and energy. But now... Was your father Mr. Freeze? Exactly. My dad is Mr. Freeze. Great question. Freeze is my real last name I was born with, and uh, it's spelled exactly the same way. And, of course, the Batman movie references. My four younger sisters all have children. They call me Annie Freeze. I have a long list. of. <laughs> if I was actually to make up a weather name, I think I would go with, like, Tsunami or Windy Breeze or something like that. But uh, I'll take Amy Freeze. It fits. It's a real name. <laughs> exactly. It's my real name. I was born this way. In fact, you know, um, I have a great relationship relationship with my dad. He's the one who started me running when I was about eight years old. Um, he would take me out on Saturday mornings and he was definitely the community roadrunner of the 80s, um, showing up in the different races when they were just getting started, where people were coming together, sort of these weekend warriors, if you uh -huh. will. And it was the birth of all the roadrunner um, organizations as we know them now, mm -hmm. late 70s, early 80s. And uh, my dad was just so, so enthusiastic about this that he brought us along, his children, for the fun runs and to spectate and support him. And so that's where my, my love of running really began. Was hey, growing to up. your dad. All right, great. Mm -hmm. And your sisters, do they athletically inclined they're, as well? They are athletically inclined, but they're all a lot taller than me, Will. So they all have played Division One basketball. I was like the shorter runner cheerleader of the family okay. and so uh, that's how it turned out for me but it's okay because i ran my first half marathon when i was 11 years old since then i've done nine marathons Excellent. that seed that my dad planted has served me well throughout my life wow. taking me a lot of cool places excellent excellent now you're wearing green 
Mm -hmm. Is that a hint to you, a partly Irish or anything like that? I mean, well, what's the heritage of the DeFries name? You can't really tell. Yeah, you can't really tell. It's kind of a melting pot. Uh, my mother's heritage is uh, definitely from Pioneer Heritage coming across the plains. She's from uh, the Utah area. But also on my dad's side, they were sharecroppers in southern Colorado early on. Wow. And so uh, we are definitely the pioneer uh, vein of the family tree. But I did have the cellular DNA stuff done where yeah, you can send yeah. in the swab. And so I have an Irish heritage mixed with an Australian Indian background. So that's kind of an interesting cellular makeup. But uh, I have redheaded sisters and blonde sisters. And uh, like I said, our height wow. range goes from 5'4 to 6'1. Well, the family picture <laughs> must, uh, must be spectacular. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's oh, great. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. so, so here you are in Indiana. Where did you go to high school and so forth? Uh, I went to Jeffersonville High School, where I was a cheerleader, and I also varsity lettered in track and cross country. Oh, the running and, started. Uh, oh, well, you're right. 11 yes, years old, you did yeah, your first yeah. half. Yeah, I was uh, right in it from the beginning, and I loved running. I had a lot of good good influences while I was in high school, particularly my cross country coach, Coach Calbert. Uh, just a very supportive and encouraging person. Um, very disciplined, you know, making sure that we showed up for practice, that we were there on time. He also supported us in our, our personal achievements as well, what we did in the classroom. And uh, I really appreciated that, you know, looking back on it, I think to myself, he was such a strong influence. At the time, you know, you just see him as your coach showing up every day. But just that simple example that he kind of consistently brought to the table mm -hmm. for me as a young person has served me well uh, my entire life. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then in college, what did you study? Well, in college, I actually got a cheerleading scholarship. So I was a cheerleader at Brigham really? Young University. And uh, I studied communications. I actually wanted to be a newspaper writer. And somehow that transitioned to broadcast journalism. And uh, then I was working in a newsroom. And they said, we need someone to do the weather. Freeze is your last name. You should do the weather. And so it all began there. So, so your name My name guided. led me. Yes, it led me to the legacy of actually being on television doing the weather. That's great. You know, if you were working at a police station, you would be patrolman freeze Officer or detector freeze. freeze. Yes. There's actually a study of this. So when you have a particular name, uh, sometimes that name then influences your career path. And it's actually a science called nominative determinism. So if you think about it, probably somewhere along your life, you've crossed like Dr. Bones, who's a chiropractor, or, you know, um, Dr. Crown, who does dental work, you know, different people who have different uh, things. Oh, <laughs> I mean, a nurse, I nurse healing. Nurse healing, exactly. So all kinds of different things like that. But it worked out in my case. So they asked you to do the weather report. Mm -hmm. You must have clicked because you're now a full time weather person, a meteorologist, right. you have a degree in it. I wish so, that click went a little faster than it actually did. The click took a longer time. I had to go back to school. I got a degree, a BS in, in science and, of course, in meteorology. And then I went and got a master's degree at University of Pennsylvania. So um, I have an environmental sciences degree. And, and my specialty in meteorology has to do with radars and being able to interpret radar data. But also it has to do with water quality and storm water runoff. So this is a big deal for us here in the boroughs yeah. and just a small amount of rain can cause the flooding problems. And of course, when we get all of the rain runoff, just a small amount, a tenth of an inch of rain can cause what are combi called combined sewer overflows mm -hmm. that race into the river. And so they take the pollutants of the streets, you know, as raw sewage out into the waterways. And this is a way that we have to, to deal with, um, you know, limited water capacity, mm -hmm. but it also affects our water quality. So that's what I did my master's research on. And I love talking about it. We could do a whole show uh, <laughs> to talk about it, but uh, it's very fascinating. It has a lot to do with, you know, day-to-day -day weather. Oh, and predictions. Okay. So you went back to school and mm -hmm. that's really, you developed your love for talking about the weather. Yes, absolutely. And you, in fact, I said you, they could find you on WABC in the mornings, but, but you're more than that. You were actually a pioneer. You were one, probably one of the first meteorologist, weather reporter with a degree in, in the weather. Yes, I, I was one of the first women to have a what we call a broadcast, broadcast certificate from the American Meteorological Society. And I was the first woman to give the weather at night in Chicago on television. Dangerously cold. It takes just 10 minutes in weather like this to get frostbite. What you'll wake up to tomorrow morning and when we get relief next on Fox Chicago News. So I was the first chief meteorologist uh, for a Fox affiliate there in Chicago. And it was a wonderful opportunity because, you know, the weather is absolutely crazy there, just like it is here in New York. Oh, wow. That mm -hmm. is fascinating. Well, you know, we've all been watching the weather forever. Mm -hmm. Well, what I notice 
when the anchor turns over to the weather person, the vibes completely changes. All of a sudden, it becomes lively, and you're, the weather person is almost expected to be an entertainer because there's always a little joke going on first <laughs> before the weather. 1010 and the exclusive 10 day trend. Right now we have rain across the area. Live power Doppler tracking the showers which are moving from south to north over just the last hour out on Michigan Plaza. Time lapse to show you the wet streets around the city. The rain will continue overnight tonight, but you can see the swirl in the clouds. When you're in front of that screen, mm -hmm. so are you scripted for that? Because the weather could change up to the moment right. you know, you're up on TV. Yeah, that's the most surprising surprising thing for people is to find out that it's not scripted. And when we talk about the weather, it's what we call ad lib. And we have a certain amount of time, usually around three minutes, where we give the forecast. But the thing that is very similar to what we do compared to everyone else on the broadcast is we're telling a story. Our story is just one that we have to ad lib and really have to tell it within the time constraints. So I think it's a relief sometimes for the the anchorman or anchorwoman uh, to turn the mic over from unscripted to now the ad lib. And so that way a little more personality might come through. And when I start talking about the weather, it's basically the things that I've learned or the data that I've collected. So I know it very well. And I use the maps that you see on TV kind of as prompts or even as evidence to say, see, here's what's happening right here. And I think that helps people not only because it, it elevates their confidence in the forecast, they're seeing it for themselves, but it also allows them to start to sort of navigate how that weather information is going to help them in their life. It's so much more now than it, you know, was years ago because the technology is so quick. Mm -hmm. So I can actually help you not only for what you're going to wear, but also so you don't have to carry as many things. You don't want to take your umbrella if you're not going to need it until after seven or eight o'clock at night because uh -huh. you're going to be home by then and be able to pick it up before you go out for the evening hours. I mm -hmm. don't think of the weather like that. I just want to know it's going to rain or not. <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> well, hot Well, I can or help not. you there, When too. it's to free, it's going to be yes, over. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But think of it, you know, if you had your week planned and you really do have to get something do done outdoors and you know that freeze is coming for the second half of the week, maybe you can flop your squat oh, schedule. Well, well, you you know what you say is definitely true for runners, as you know, you yes, know, the big training. race is, is Boston and New York and they and the runners, I guess, go crazy. They want to know two weeks in advance right. to know how to prepare. Mm -hmm. So you probably get calls from your running friends. Amy, is there any tips for New York or Boston? So yes. how far can you really forecast for Boston, for example? We can give you a good uh, 15 to 15 day trend, sort of a two week out, outlook and give you a general idea. Of course, I can tell you that in the spring of Boston, pretty much anything can go. We've had extremes there where it's been very, very hot for the runners. We had, of course, last year where we had the extreme rain totally affected the race. And then we've also had snow during the Boston Marathon. I know. So um, we can give you some trends, but we are best seven days out. We are very, very good five days out, and we are the most accurate three days out. And the reason for that is because the closer we are to the initial time, the better the computer, computer okay. models can get the numbers just right. Okay, so the sweet spot, a three-day forecast. Yeah. I wouldn't give you seven days if I didn't believe in it, so okay. I give seven days. Okay. You know, weather is in the news all the time. I don't know if you heard this story from uh, one of the uh, leading congresswomen, just elected from Queens, mm -hmm. and she made a forecast about the weather. <laughs> The world going to end in 12 years if we don't do something about weather climate. So what is your take? Is it 12 years really the end of the world? <laughs> well, you know, climate change is happening and there's a lot of science to support that. But the interesting thing is that humans have been on the planet for a relatively short amount of time compared to the age of the Earth. And we know that through science. And so the more peer-reviewed science that we have gives us better predictions about what could happen in the future. Now, it's true that, you know, what we do in our lives matters and it affects the environments we live in. That's without question. But the power of human activity to affect a planet's weather is still in question in some cases. So, of course, we know when the Industrial Revolution was happening, all the pollution that caused, how bad that would be for air quality mm -hmm. or water quality. Mm -hmm. Some things just make common sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the concept of changing a light bulb to avoid ice caps in a different place, I think that the focus is really just using the best energy possible, um, living environmentally friendly, thinking about the habits that we have and how that affects water and earth mm -hmm. and even air, of course. 
all of those things are very important. So the end of the world in 12 years, I'm not into that kind of prediction business. I think we'll all be along for a very long time. But I think the quality of our earth does depend on the habits we create. And uh, some of it is pretty dramatic and drastic, but the evolution of the earth has happened way before we arrived uh -huh. and it will continue for a very long time. So there's adaptations that we need to make. There's certain responsibilities that we have yeah. with the earth, yeah. but our ability to control what happens on the planet may not be as within grasp as we'd like to believe. So I think that human activity is important, yeah. but I don't necessarily think that we can control the weather. Can't control the weather, <laughs> but I, I know I've had other guests. I had the, um, the person of the Downtown Alliance of New York, and they're, and they're worried about uh, Lower Manhattan flooding. Sea, ri sea level rise. Mm -hmm. Right, because, you know, the Which are, those are things that are already underway. Um, we have predictions for the short term, either 10, 20, uh, 50 years from now, how the sea level rise prediction will happen based on what's already occurring. And that's similar to weather forecasting. Yeah. What's happening right now is very dependent on what's going to happen over the next couple of days. Same thing with large scale predictions. What's happening right now, we can predict what's happening in the future. However, keep in mind, weather's not a perfect science and neither is climate prediction. Mm -hmm. So other factors can play a major role in either exaggerating those outcomes or minimizing them. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I know they already started redoing, for example, the- um, Sea walls. The, the, the sea walls mm -hmm. and, and one of the parks they're going to completely redo it again, the east side uh, river park. Mm -hmm. They just rehabilitated it, and now they're going to do it again because they want to raise it. Right. So protect it from future, you know, Sandys and future yes. superstorms. Mm -hmm. All that stuff makes sense, you know, based on the information that we have to make plans and to make adjustments for our own living environments is extremely extraordinarily important. Everything from um, better drainage in our neighborhoods, which they'll be doing that with all the parks, they'll yeah. be able to drain off yeah. better, but also just protecting our water quality, turning off the faucets, things like that. Switching from a very heavily meat-based diet to more of a plant-based diet can really help with water quality. So there's lots of things to, to research. Are you a vegetarian? Uh, I'm not, but I've been, I've been sort of pushing myself towards it more and more because the more I learn about the requirements to produce just a small amount of meat and yeah. how much water is required for that. It kind of, you know, makes sense. And also with our nutrition as well. I'm not, I'm definitely not a proponent of avoid it for your yeah, entire yeah. life. Um, but I may get to that point. I don't know. I've definitely been swinging in, in a different direction lately. It's interesting. So you Midwestern corn fed yeah, yeah, <laughs> girl. Yeah. It's interesting. You think about the weather corn all fed. the time. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, your, it's, your, it's your life. Weather affects everything. Yeah, yeah, it does. And people say if you, if you meet somebody for the first time, if you don't know what to talk about, talk about the weather. It's true. That's how you meet your neighbors in the elevator here in New York, right? Talk about their dog or the weather. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what was the first big running event that you recall? But I think probably my first marathon was um, pretty monumental. I ran the Colorado Marathon and it actually snowed that morning about six inches and temperatures were freezing. And then by the time I finished the marathon, four hours later, it was 55 degrees and bright sunshine. The snow had disappeared. <laughs> so a lot can happen in four hours. Um, that was a quite memorable race. But yeah, I'm a bit of a social runner. So mo most of all of the marathons that I can think of that I've participated in over the years are affiliated with friends that I've met up with or training partners that I've had over time mm -hmm. um, or big experiences. Um, I did the San Diego Rock and Roll uh, marathon, which was a lot of fun. And this spring, I'm planning on going to London. So that'll be um, a lot of fun to do the London Marathon as part of the World Majors. Oh, cool. So mm -hmm. have you done other World Majors like Chicago? Yes. Or, mm -hmm. Have you done Chica New York? Chicago and New York, yes. How many times have you done New York? Five New Yorks. So mm -hmm. you're doing New York again? I think it's the best one. Yes, I love it. It's absolutely so much fun. My role has sort of transitioned a little bit of a recent, though. Instead of for the New York races like the New York City Half or even the full marathon, instead of being a registered runner, I run as a broadcaster. And so that requires a do not finish because I'm going to be getting on and off the course. So I have run the marathon before where they hand me the equipment and I run with it on and I stay on the course the entire time. 
But now that we do so many hours of broadcasting, we want to feature as many runners as possible from super fast to maybe more middle of packers. It requires me to be on a motorcycle parts of the oh, race. Okay. And so if I get on and off the course, then oh, of course it doesn't so qualify. Fancy. So fact, I've probably done New York many more times, but I've actually finished five times. You know, you're really more than a weather person. You're a TV personality. I think I described you because I guess most weather people are personalities in that they have the talent to go out. In your case, you can interview other runners because I think I saw you do the uh, Foot Locker Five Barrel Challenge. You were interviewing <laughs> them. And of course, they were so pleased that Amy Freeze is interviewing me. I love interviewing the runners. It's so much fun, not only to hear their stories, but a lot of times with runners, you just naturally have something in common. And so a lot of times when I do a feature on someone, we become friends and then I know them for a long time afterwards. And that's one of the magic things I think about running is whatever way you meet someone that can kind of come into your life and you've immediately got something common. So it may seem quite glamorous to have the, the TV person interviewing you, but in reality, you're just meeting another runner and don't be surprised when I call you up to say, hey, let's do a training run. So you don't belong to an actual team. You, you just run with friends and so forth. Correct. I run with back on my feet. I've run with the multiple my Loma Research Foundation and, of course, the Challenge Athletes Foundation. I've done many events with them over the years. And those are just a few of the many organizations that I like to support and, and be a part of. Excellent. Mm -hmm. and then in closing, is there any exciting new developments coming up in, in the weather? The forecasting is getting better all the time because science just gets better all the time. And I think the, the real challenge here is in a day and age when we can just open our phones, our smartphones, and see what the high temperature is, we think, oh, I don't need that. I've got the weather right here. The value of a human forecaster is always going to be there to interpret the data or to tell you. Because if I tell you it's going to be 60 degrees, just like you saw on your phone, that's not very that's not very good service. But if I tell you that 60 degrees is gonna feel very muggy and uncomfortable and exceptionally warm, mm -hmm. that makes a difference to you rather than it's gonna feel like uh, a very damp, cool 60 degrees. You're gonna wanna make sure you have a, an extra coat and your rain gear with you. So sometimes the numbers don't always represent the weather. And so I think that the future of forecasting really is, yes, better science, but also better interpretation, better ability to communicate the message of what the weather feels like. I don't want everyone to know how good I am at science or all my expertise. What I want them to know is that I'm telling them the right weather. So if I'm correct and my message reflects what they feel, that's the best reward. Because as long as I have the, you know, the stuff behind the scenes to make sure I know what I'm talking about, the message is the most important thing. So I challenge people when they want to find their best weather data or their favorite forecaster to sort of listen to the message and see if it reflects what they experience. Is still a smartphone app that you recommend to track the weather? Of course, the AccuWeather app, of course. Accu you know, WABC's AccuWeather app, it's free. You can download it in any of the app stores. And I think it's great because you can get radar at your fingertips. You also can get personal messages that you set in there for whatever area you live in. Or if you have somebody who lives maybe even out of state, you can set messages and alerts for their area. If you have family or friends, you want to be alerted when they have severe weather, you can stay on top of that. I think yeah, that's pretty and, easy. And air quality is also important, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the UV index, you know. For runners, absolutely. absolutely. This is something that's we have to right. pay attention to. That's right. So something you somehow involved in a special way with Disney. So to close, mm -hmm. what is your relationship? with the Disney Marathon. WABC Television is owned by Disney. Um, they own ESPN, they own all the um, ABC uh, O and O uh, stations across the board. So Disney is sort of the parent company. I work for Mickey Mouse, basically, at the end of the day. <laughs> so definitely on my bucket list is to go and do the Disney Marathon. And it's, it's unique because they not only have the marathon, they actually have a series of races. It's called the Goofy. And you can do the 5K, the 10K, the half marathon, and the marathon all together. So, Amy, you yes. won't believe it. I'm going to have Mr. Goofy right after this. You have to meet him. <laughs> I will look forward to that. Amy, thank you so much for coming in. Will, my pleasure. See you on the run. <laughs>